everyone and welcome! It's time to cover the last Vastaya on our list. And of course it has to be the most popular one. I don't think she needs any further introduction, so let's get right into Ari's story. Many years ago, Ari was abandoned in the snowy woods of northern Ionia. She knew nothing about her original family. All she had to remind her their existence was a pair of matching gemstones. She joined a pack of ice foxes as they stalked prey on their morning hunt. And before long, they adopted her as one of their own. With no one to teach her the magic of her kind, Ari instinctively learned to draw it from the world around her, shaping destructive spheres and quickening her reflexes to take down prey. If she was close enough, she could even soothe a deer into a state of tranquility. So much that it remained calm even as she sank her teeth into its flesh. Ari first encountered humans when a troop of foreign soldiers camped near her den. Their behaviors were strange to Ari, and curious to learn more, she watched them from afar. She was especially drawn to a hunter who, unlike his wasteful companions, used every part of the animals he killed, reminding her of her fox family. When the hunter was wounded by an arrow, Ari felt his life seeping away. She instinctively devoured the essence leaving his body and gained brief flashes of his memories. The lover he had lost in battle, his children from a strange land of iron and stone. She found she could push his emotions from fear to sorrow to joy and charmed him with visions of grassy field bathing in the sunlight as he died. Euphoric at the rush of absorbing the hunter's life, Ari felt more alive than ever and traveled Ionia in search for more victims. She relished toying with her prey, shifting their emotions before consuming their life essence. She altered between dazzling them with visions of beauty, hallucinations of deep longing and occasionally dreams colored by raw sorrow. She grew drunk with memories that were not her own and she felt happy in the lives of others. Through stolen visions, Ari watched through their eyes as they pledged loyalty to a temple of shadow sacrificed offerings to a god of the sun incarnate, encountered an avian tribe of Vastaya that spoke only in song and glimpsed mountainous landscape unlike any she had seen. She experienced the heartbreak and happiness in tantalizing flashes that left her wanting more and wept at the massacres of Ionian villagers at the hands of Noxian invaders. Ari was surprised when the memories led her to discover the tale of an unearthly fox demon. As she absorbed more life essence, she grew to identify more and more with her victims and felt guilty at ending so many lives. She feared that the myths about her were true. She was no more than a cruel monster. But whenever too much time passed between feedings, she sensed her own power fade and could not help but partake once more. Ari tested her self-control by consuming small quantities of life essence, enough to absorb a memory or two but not enough to kill. She was successful, for a time, but was tortured by her unending hunger and soon couldn't resist the temptation, indulging in the dreams of an entire coastal village. Tormented by her mistake, Ari could not forgive herself and felt deep sorrow that forced her to question her own existence. She withdrew to the forest caves, isolating herself in hopes of controlling her relentless desire. Years later she emerged, determined to experience every facet of life through her own eyes. Though she might indulge in occasional essence, she resisted consuming entire lives. With the twin gemstones as the only clue of her origin, Ari set out in search of others like her. No more would she rely on borrowed memories and unfamiliar dreams. The following story takes us into an Ionian village. Its market smelled of burning incense and rotting cabbage. Ari wrapped her cloak around her nine tails and fiddled with the twin sunstone tokens to distract herself from the stench, rolling them between her fingers and snapping them together. Each one had the shape of a blazing flame, but they were carved in such a way that their sharper edges fit together, forming a perfectly smooth orb. She had carried the golden stone since before she could remember but to this day she had no knowledge of their origin. Though Ari was in a new environment, she was confronted by the latent magic buzzing all around her. She passed a stand with dozens of woven baskets filled with polished rocks, 
Shells etched with legends from a seafaring tribe. Gambling dice carved from bones. And other curious items. Nothing matched the style of Ari's tokens. Care for a gem to match the blue of the skies? Asked a grey bearded merchant. For you, I'll trade a Cerulean bubble for the cost of a single cry raven feather. Or perhaps the seed of a Jubji tree. I'm flexible. Ari smiled at him but shook her head and continued through the market. Sunstones in hand. She passed a stand covered in spiky orange vegetables. A child selling fruit that shifted color with the weather. And at least three peddlers swinging tins of incense. Each of whom claimed to have discovered the deepest form of meditation. Fortunes! Come get your fortunes told! Call the young woman with lavender eyes and soft jawline. Find out who you'll fall in love with. Or how to avoid unlucky situations with a pinch of burdock root. Or if you'd prefer your future left to the gods, I'll answer a question about your past. Though I do recommend finding out whether or not you are at risk for death by poisoning. A tall Vastaya with feline ears was about to take a bite from a spiced pastry. He froze and stared at the fortune teller in alarm. The answer is no, by the way. Yours for free. She said, courtesying at him before turning to Ari. Now you look like you've had a dark and mysterious past. Or at least some tales worth sharing. Any burning question for me, lady? Beneath heavy layers of incense, Ari paused at the scent of wet fur and spiced leather lingering at the woman's neck. Thank you, but no. She replied. I'm still looking around. You won't find any more Yamelo tokens in this market, I'm afraid. The woman said, nodding at Ari's sunstones. Like the ones you have. The back of Ari's neck prickled as she drew closer to the woman. She would not let her excitement get the better of her. Do you recognize these? Where do they come from? The woman eyed Ari. I think they are Yamelos anyway, she said. Never seen a pair in person. He only carved a small number in his time. And many of the sets were separated in the war. Dead rare, those. Ari leaned closer with each word. I'm hiring, by the way, the woman said. Do you know where I might find this craftsman? Ari asked. Hyrin laughed. No idea. But if you come, I'll tell you what I know. Ari wrapped her cloak around her shoulders and eagerly followed the fortune teller past her booth and into a caravan decorated wall to wall with animal skins. Tea? Hyrin said. I brewed it this morning. She poured two cups of liquid the color of plum wine, taking one for herself. The tea tasted of bitter oak bark, masked by a drop of overly sweet honey. Hyrin held out a hand for the stones, but Ari kept them close. I am getting the sense that these are special to you, she said with a wry smile. Don't worry, I have no interest in peddling stolen sunstones. Bad for a girl's reputation. Can you tell me where they come from? Asked Ari, handing them over gingerly. Hyrin held them up to the light. These are beautiful, she said. I don't know how they fit together so perfectly. I've not seen the like. Ari said nothing. She stood frozen with curiosity and did not take her eyes off the woman. Legend says that the sculptor known as Yamelo collected fossilized lizard eggs from a thousand thousand years ago that he carved into intricate shapes. These ancient lizards lived long before the Getu Sea dried up to a desert, leaving only petrified bones and dust. Hyrin coughed, and Ari detected a bitter note upon her breath, as if she had been drinking vinegar. Yamelo stones are designed as small pieces that fit into a larger sculpture. She continued. The woman dangled the golden pieces in front of Ari's face. Just as your past has left you with information to be desired, these stones may have many more pieces that, when combined, create another shape altogether. Who knows what you'll become when you track down your history. With the missing pieces, you may learn more than you'd like. Those are pretty words. Ari murmured, staring at the woman. After a moment of silence, Hyrin chuckled. Some threads of truth. Threads of my own invention. A fortune teller's wavering must be seamless. The woman retrieved a hunter's knife from a cabinet. I weave in just enough of what you desire to make you stay, she said. Till the tea slows your muscles, that is. A low growl escaped Ari's lips. She would tear this woman apart. She tried to pounce, but her limbs did not obey. She was rooted in place. Oh, there's no need for that, lady. I only need a single tail. 
useful for a variety of potions, you see, and extremely valuable, or so I think. Never seen a Vastaya with foxtails before. The tea freezes any pain, along with your mobility. Hyrin wrapped a bandage around one of Ari's tails. Ari tried to resist, but she still could not move. You'll wake up tomorrow, good as new, said the woman. Well, with one less tail. Do you really use all nine? Ari shut her eyes and reached out to the reservoirs of magic around her. The environment had plenty ripe for the taking, but she was too weakened by the tea to draw them to her. Instead, she reached into Hyrin's mind, which was far more malleable and pushed. Ari opened her eyes and stared into Hyrin's. They deepened from lavender to violet. Hyrin, she said. Come closer. I would look into the face of the one who tricked me. Of course, lady, Hyrin replied, transfixed. The woman's voice sounded hollow, as though it came from the bottom of a well. She leaned in until her face was only inches away. Ari inhaled, drawing essence of the woman's life from her breath. Hyrin was a young girl hiding, hungry and afraid beneath a market stall. Two men argued above, looking for her. She had nothing but empty coffers to show for her day's work. Ari continued to drain Hyrin's life, sampling memories of raw emotion. They felt rich in Ari's mouth, and she relished each unique flavor of emotion. Hyrin told the fortune of a witch doctor shrouded in veils, receiving a copper for her troubles. She used the coin to buy a piece of bread which she devoured in seconds. In a seedy tavern, a raucous group played cards. A man with eyebrows resembling butterfly wings gambled a golden yellow stone while Hyrin watched from the shadows. Hyrin tracked Ari as she walked through the market. One of her fox tails peeked beneath her cloak. She draw the Vastaya into her caravan. Enough. Ari stopped, her head spinning with renewed vigor. With each memory she stole from Hyrin, she felt energy rush back into her weakened muscles, cleansing them of the poison. Strengthened once more, she slowly shook her limbs awake and flexed her tails with a shiver. Hyrin stood wide-eyed and dazed, still very much alive. It was she that would wake tomorrow, good as new, less a few memories that she would not miss. With knowledge of the woman's life, Ari's rage had faded. She brushed her hand against the fortune teller's cheek, then wrapped her cloak tightly around her shoulders and stepped out into the sunlit market. Hyrin would not remember her or their encounter, but Ari had left the trade with a name to hunt, Yamelo, and the image of the man with soft-winged eyebrows was burned into her mind. There is one more story that takes us into one of Ionia's beautiful gardens. A gust of wind blew cold night air from the garden, carrying with it scents of overripe fruits and blooming flowers. Ari stood before the garden's entrance, where stone transitioned to soil and narrow caves opened to the sky in the deep grove. Thickets of trees and brambles grew wild beneath the moonlight, while flowers bloomed in lush abundance. Ari hesitated, knowing well the twin nature of danger and beauty. She had heard legends of this sacred grove since childhood, but had never once before traveled to the southern caves to find it. According to the stories, those who stepped over the threshold of the garden began as one person and left as someone else entirely, or did not leave at all. Whatever the truth might be, Ari had made her mind. As she stepped into the garden, the back of her neck prickled as if someone were watching her. No figure was visible amongst the trees, but the garden was far from still. Everywhere Ari looked, new flowers bloomed with each passing second. Ari walked a winding path through the tangled plants, stepping over roots rumbling beneath the soil. She ducked under hanging vines that reached out to her as if asking for affection. She could have sworn she heard a hush from the soft rustling of leaves. Moonbeams shone through the branches above, revealing trees bearing leaves of silver and gold. A snow lily stretched toward Ari's face and caressed her cheek gently. It was too alluring to resist. Ari pressed her face into its petals and inhaled its intoxicating scent. 
Her nose chilled as she took in the faint smell of oranges, the summer breeze and the tang of a fresh gill. The blossom trembled as it blushed with color and Ari's breath caught in her throat. She swayed, dizzy at the flower's perfume. A snip. The snow lily fell to the soil, severed at its stem. A viscous liquid seeped from the cut. Ari let out a breath, her nine tails twitching as her head cleared. Ari startled as a woman with wisps of grey-white hair stood before her, shears in hand. She was wrapped in colorful robes and her eyelashes sprinkled with dew. As the woman turned her sea-green gaze to Ari, Ari felt a strange unease. As if the woman could slice through her gut just as easily as a fibrous stalk. The woman's face, wrinkled like tree bark, was impossible to read. But Ari was no longer concerned for her own safety. You startled me, Igelia, said Ari. In the stories, the old woman was known as the Eater of Secrets, the Forgotten, or the Witch Gardener. Wanting to show respect to one with such power, Ari decided to call her Igelia, Great Grandmother. The flowers want something from us, she said. Just as we seek something from them, it would be wise to keep your nose to yourself. I would know. I have to feed these hungry babies myself. So you are the gardener, said Ari. One of my kinder names, yes. But quite beside the point. I know why you're here, Amina. Little one, Ari felt uncomfortable at the word, often used in a familial relationship, though she was not sure why. You seek absolution, freedom from your pain, said the gardener. She stepped over a shrinking fern and beckoned to Ari. Come. As they walked through the moonlit garden, flowers turned to face the old woman as if she were the sun itself, warming their leaves and helping them grow. Or perhaps the flowers did not wish to turn their backs to her. The old woman waved Ari to a bench in front of a gnarled cloud fruit tree and sat opposite of her. Let me guess. You were in love, the gardener said a smile crinkling the corners of her lips. Ari's borrow frowned. Don't worry, you're far from the first, said the old woman. So who was he? A soldier? An adventurer? A warrior in exile? An artist, said Ari. She had not uttered the syllables of his name in over a year and could not bring herself to say them now. They were like swallowing broken glass. He painted. Flowers. Ah, a romantic. The gardener said. I killed him. Ari spat. Is that romantic enough to you? As she spoke the truth aloud, Ari could not disguise the sharp bitterness on her tongue. I sucked the life from his lips as he lay dying in my arms. She said. He was kinder, more selfless than anyone had a right to be. I thought I could suppress my urges, but the taste of his dreams and memories were too enticing. He urged me on. I did not resist. And now, now I cannot go on knowing what I did. Please, Igelia, can you give me the gift of oblivion? Can you make me forget? The gardener did not answer. She stood and picked a ripe cloud fruit from the tree and peeled it slowly, carefully, so the skin remained in one piece. The flesh fell into six red segments, which she offered to Ari. Care for a slice? Ari stared at her. Don't worry, this one doesn't want anything from you. Not like the flowers. Fruit never does. Fruit is the most generous part of a plant. It strives to be luscious and juicy and tempting. It simply wants to attract. Food turns to ash in my mouth, said Ari. How can I feed myself when I am no more than a monster? Even monsters need to eat, you know, the gardener said, smiling gently. She placed one of the cloud fruit segments into her mouth and chewed before making a face. Tart! In all my years in the garden, I've never gotten used to the tang. The old woman ate the remaining pieces while Ari sat in silence. When she was finished, she wiped the juice from her mouth. So you stole a life that was not yours to take, said the gardener. Now you suffer from the consequences. I cannot stand it, Ari said. To be alive is to be in pain, I'm afraid, the gardener said. A vine dripping with snow lily buds wound its way around the old woman's arm. The woman did not flinch. I can't go on knowing I killed him, Ari pleaded. 
There are greater consequences to losing yourself, I mean. Huh? The gardener reached for Ari's hand and squeezed it. Her sea-green eyes glinted in the moonlight, and Ari detected something she had not seen before. Longing, perhaps? You will be broken, said the old woman. You will never again be one. I am always in fragments, Ari replied. And every second that passes, I split myself anew. Please, Igelia, I must do this. The old woman sighed. This garden will not refuse a gift freely given, for it always hungers. With that, the gardener offered her arm to Ari, still entwined with the vine of snow lilies, but unfurled like outstretched hands. Give your breath to this flower as you think on the memories you wish to be rid of. The old woman said, gesturing to the bell-shaped lily. The flower will consume them. Do not inhale again until you feel nothing. Ari held the flower gently between her fingers. The gardener nodded. Ari took a deep breath and exhaled into the flower. <sighs> Ari stood next to a raven-haired man at the edge of a lake. Together they leapt into the water and screamed as they frolicked over endless waves. Ari suffering dissolved like a cloud along with the image in her mind. In a forest silenced by winter, Ari watched a raven-haired man painting a single blossom. Am I not your flower? She asked, pulling the strap down from her dress. He lifted his brush and smeared paint over her bare back. The bristles tingled as he recreated the flower atop her spine. You are. You are. He repeated, kissing her shoulder with each word. Ari knew she should dread what would happen next, but her heart was growing cold and numb. She stood at the center of a lake, holding the lifeless body of the man she once loved. He dipped beneath the water, becoming contorted through the glassy refraction. Once this vision would have caused stabbing pain, but Ari felt no more than a dull ache. Ari leaned over a fallen woodcutter in a stone cavern, consuming his life. At the sound of boots crunching snow, she startled. The raven-haired man stood, watching. Ari despaired. She had not wanted him to see this. I can't be good enough for you, Ari said. Look at me, greeting for the soul of a dying man. Please, leave me. I am not good. I cannot be good. Her raven-haired laugh responded. I don't care. This was the first time Ari remembered someone loving her wholly, in spite of her nature. His voice was warm and deep with emotion. I am yours. The memory caught in Ari's throat as she stopped breathing, breaking the flower's spell. No, she thought. I can't lose this. Ari tried to inhale, but the air felt like a noose around her neck. It choked her and stifled her throat, as if she were breathing poison. Her vision blackened, but she gasped until her lungs were almost bursting. Losing this would kill him all over again. Ari's knees gave out as she collapsed on the ground, still gripping the snow lily. The unnatural perfume she inhaled from the flower raided through her mind, conjuring strange and disturbing visions. Ari hallucinated. In a snow-silenced forest, she envisioned each of her nine tails ripped from her spine, only to grow back so it could be torn off again. In a stone cavern, she saw dozens of portraits of herself painted in inky black brushstrokes. In each of these images, her face was blank and cold. She floated weightless at the center of a lake and looked down to see that the lake was not filled with water, but with blood. Where are you? In her mind's eyes, she saw a face wrapped by the endless folds of her memory, one she was already forgetting. The face was blurred, like a painting of a man rather than the man himself. He looked at her, stared into her, but she could not meet his gaze. Ari opened her eyes. The gardener was standing above her, holding the vine of snow lilies, which had turned raven black. Can you still see him? asked the old woman. Ari focused on the hazy shapes in her mind and focused until they materialized into a face. His face. Yes. It's cloudy, but I remember, said Ari. She fixed the image of his face in her mind, memorizing every detail. She would not let it dissolve. The old woman's eyes flashed, not with longing, but regret. 
Then you did what many had not the strength to do. You did not succumb to bees. I couldn't, said Ari, choking over her words. I couldn't give him up, even if I am a monster. Even if each day I fall apart and each day I must bear the pain a hundred times over. Oblivion is worse, much worse. Because Oblivion was a thousand blurry faces staring at her with empty eyes. You cannot take back what you gave, Imina, the gardener said. The flowers do not relinquish what was freely given, but you may keep what remains. Go, go, leave this place before it takes hold, she whispered. Vines coiled around the gardener's shoulders, revealing lilies of deep sea green, as it's done to so many others. Ari tried to stand, but vines of snow lilies had wound its way around her tails. She struggled against their tightening clutches, prying barbs from her fur, then scrambled to her feet and ran. Knotted roots broke loose from the soil, trying to ensnare her as she leapt over them. A tangled curtain of thorned moon roses formed to block Ari's path, but she held her breath and dove beneath the flowers, which caught wisps of her hair as she tumbled. The path from the garden was overgrown with snow lilies of all colors. Their leaves, sharp as blades, slashed at Ari's skin, while thick stalks coiled around her face and neck, binding her mouth. Ari bit down and ripped through the fibers with her teeth, tasting sour blood. She tore through the arcway to the stone caverns beyond. She could just make out the gardener's voice. A piece of you lingers here, always, the old woman called. Unlike us, the garden does not forget. Ari did not turn back. And that was the story of Ari. I'll be honest, this story was way deeper than I thought. We got multiple new characters and a hint of a possible greater character for the future stories. Of course I mean the legendary craftsman who no doubt will have a bigger role. But I guess that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, feel free to click the like button below. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Discord if you'd like to chat. I also now have Instagram if you are interested in bazillion pictures of coffee. And with that, thank you so much for being here and for your support, you know I really appreciate it. And as always, thank you come again.